the world's first sports car. We are mere mortals, but these cars are really immortal. I think it is over-engineered. It takes your breath away. I feel like a king in here. When you accelerate away, the power comes in. Carl Benz was the son of an engine driver, born in Karlsruhe in Germany in the 1840s. After being apprenticed to a local foundry, he eventually started up his own little engineering workshop in Mannheim. He didn't make a lot of money, and for many years the, uh, the business was, shall we say, running from hand to mouth. But this was a time when the first internal combustion engines were running and before long Benz thought he would like to have a go at building some sort of machine with an engine to take the place of horses. The very first machine ran under its own power sometime during 1885 and by the following year it had been seen out and about on the streets of Mannheim. People were outraged at the time because even steam cars hadn't had a very good reaction at all with the public. Steam cars often used to literally explode. So when people were then developing petrol cars, the, the result was that people were very, very frightened and concerned. The car to drive is, is very basic in some ways. Uh, the fact that it's got tiller steering means that, of course, you've not got a steering wheel. You've got a, literally a, a tiller to steer the car by. Uh, the suspension is very hard and very solid. You haven't got pneumatic tyres, so therefore it's very, very firm drive. But once you've actually got the knack of driving it, it actually comes quite easily. It's driven by belt. It doesn't have gears. It had a top speed of approximately 7 miles per hour. It couldn't get up, go up hills. It was very, very slow at going up hills, so you had to push the vehicle up hills. It didn't work on ordinary petrol. And of course you had no garages in the early days, so people had to have the fuel made up at a pharmacy. So if you ran out of fuel, that was a real problem. So it's a very, very basic, very crude uh, early engine. Benz was very frustrated because the, the mayor of his town had virtually banned him from using any of the main streets. And if there was any accidents, then Benz was directly responsible whether or not he caused the accident. So this was very frustrating for him. He couldn't really prove that the car, as he developed it, could do the job that he wanted it to do to get long distances between A and B. Benz seemed to have an obsession and spent more and more and more time in his workshops. And there came a fabled occasion in 1888 when his wife and her children decided that enough was enough. One day when Benz was away, they raided the workshop, borrowed the car and went for a drive in it. They went all the way from Mannheim to Forsheim, apparently without incident, which when you think of it was a remarkable achievement. Frau Benz made her point, but so did Carl Benz, because here was a perfectly practical machine for, shall we say, unskilled people to go out and drive. If you look at any of Benz's very early models, they're beautifully manufactured, lovely pieces of engineering. Obviously he had great aspirations for the, for the car, but I don't think that he would have envisaged in those early days quite what the, the car has meant to us in these days. Great minds think alike, because while Carl Benz was inventing his tricycle, a rather older engineer called Gottlieb Daimler was also having his first thoughts about mechanical transport. By the uh, mid-1890s, both Benz and Daimler were in series production, if in those days you could call one or two hundred vehicles a year series production. Emil Jelinek, who was a politician, an entrepreneur and something of a fixer, had become an enthusiast for Daimler cars in 1897 and soon joined the board of that company. He then asked for a completely new type of car in 1901. He then said, oh and by the way, I want you to call them after my daughter. Her name is Mercedes. <laughs> Thank you.
It was a very difficult time for Germany. Defeated in the war, and then suffering from huge uh, economic problems, inflation absolutely ran away. It threatened to destroy industry in Germany. Neither Benz nor Mercedes could possibly survive without help. And so, by 1924, they were ready to join together. Before the merger, Dr. Ferdinand Porsche joined Daimler as technical director and set about the design of a series of fabulously fast six-cylinder supercharged sports cars. These developed into the S, SS and SSK models. This is a Mercedes SS from 1930. The car was owned by Bunty Scott Moncrief, a well-known Mercedes historian. I knew this car. As a child, really, I was only seven or eight years old when I first saw it. The car was in the stable at the hall where Scott Moncrief lived. And uh, I remember cycling up on my sister's bicycle and uh, creeping around the stable block, looking through a broken window and seeing this fantastic car sitting there, covered in dust, almost totally derelict, but really stunning. You know, you could see the shape of the wings, the view of the radiator. It really was the most fabulous car I'd ever seen. I grew up, I've always had an interest in old cars, it continued, and I went into the car restoration business and got to know Scott Moncrief much better. He became quite a personal friend. Bunty felt he was getting rather old, and if he didn't get his Mercedes on the road soon, then he never would drive the car. I took over the restoration, and the target was that we'd have the car finished and running for Bunty's 80th birthday. The car was finished, or virtually finished, and sadly Bunty died just a few days before his birthday. I think what this brings home to you is that we are mere mortals, but these cars are really immortal. They go on. People come and go, but the cars continue. I hope forever. It's a big car, a very big car, but once you're underway, it doesn't feel like a big car. It's a six-cylinder single overhead camshaft engine, 180 horsepower, but it also has a supercharger fitted. Now the supercharger, one can bring in and out at will, rather like a kick down on a modern uh, car fitted with automatic transmission. So if you want a little extra power, you just put your foot flat to the floor and go a little further and this brings in the supercharger. And there's a most blood curdling howl from this. It, 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 it really makes you feel like Mr. Toad when you've got this supercharger engaged because you, you fly along. And it boosts the power to 250 horsepower, so it makes quite a difference. When one bought a Mercedes in 1930, you bought the chassis. The chassis in those days cost £2,000, which was probably 10 years' wages for a working man. It meant that only the very rich royalty film stars, a rich playboy, would, would own this type of car. They would have a body of their choice built onto it. They go along to a coach builder, they decide upon a style, and the coach builder would produce the body for them. In this case, the body was made for Bunty, and if you look, you'll find it has a rather peculiar door shape. This was because Bunty had an iron caliper on his right leg. He fell down a flight of steps, in fact, and as he said, he wasn't even drunk at the time, but uh, that's another story. Um, I think this car really put Mercedes on the map again. They needed some publicity, and the S and SS, SSK series certainly did that. They won so many races. They were almost unbeatable. By the late 30s, Mercedes-Benz was the dominant car-making company in Germany. Adolf Hitler came to power in Nazi Germany in 1933 and almost immediately decided to show off German technology in almost every way that he could. One way he decided was to impress the world by the dominance of German cars in international motorsport. To do this, he offered Mercedes-Benz a big subsidy to get involved in Grand Prix racing.
From 1934 to 1939, Mercedes-Benz dominated the world Grand Prix scene of motorsport. No company before or since has spent as much money and as much time on making sure that it could win. Hitler for sure made his point about the dominance of German engineering in motorsport. But by 1939, everyone had other things on their mind. War was coming up fast, and in fact, on the very day that war broke out, the German Grand Prix cars appeared for the last time. The Second World War devastated Germany. But only seven years after it ended, Mercedes-Benz introduced the world's most exciting sports car. For the first few years after the war, all German companies had been banned from competing in motorsport. But as soon as that was lifted, Mercedes-Benz decided they had to get back into the sport at which they were so successful. The Mercedes is back again after 15 years. But the opposition has already been in the field since the end of the war, gaining a tremendous lead in design and experience. Mercedes-Benz starts from scratch, but with new ideas direct fuel injection into all eight cylinders, internal turbo brakes, and a new swing axle with a low pivot. A double victory for Mercedes-Benz and a record speed of 115.9 miles per hour. A magnificent comeback after 15 years. This car is a 1955 300 SL Gullwing, the classic Gullwing car. And I bought it in 14 packing cases that uh, came from America. And I have put it together over many years. I'd uh, had one or two old cars and I'd always liked the shape of the Gullwing. I think it's such a classic car, such a beautiful looking car, a unique car. I think it's the ultimate classic car. And I always wanted one. And when I got this opportunity to buy this one in a terrible mess, I, I couldn't resist it, and it has been a big job to restore it, but it's so beautiful now, uh, I'm thrilled to bits with it, actually. It takes your breath away. It was the ultimate sports car for, I suppose, very wealthy people. I mean, it cost nearly £5,000 when it was new in 1955. Compared to that, uh, a Jaguar 120 was about just over £1,000. A family car is about £300. So this was top of the range, and it was very, very expensive at the time. Of course, the most classic thing about this car are the doors, the gullwing doors. I mean, they, you can open them and get in and out with difficulty, I might add, but you get used to it. And uh, of course, if, if you're in a lot of traffic and it gets very hot, you can just open this door and you can drive along with the door open. And of course, because the gullwing has these curved panels on the side, they, they weren't, in 1955, able to make them as windows to wind up and down. Well, the other disadvantage is the lack of luggage space. If you look inside the boot, it's just full of spare wheel. So Mercedes decided in 1950s to design some luggage to fit behind the driver's and passenger's seats. And that was the way they got round it. And the interesting thing about this car is the steering wheel, which hinges forward to allow you to get in and out if you've got a rather light stomach like me. Of course, this car is the most fabulous car to drive. It's light, the steering's light, the acceleration is phenomenal. I mean, this car in 1955 was the fastest production car ever made. I mean, they managed to get it up to speeds of 170 miles an hour. I mean, I don't do 170 miles an hour, of course. Uh, but it is beautiful to drive. It's responsive. I, I mean, it's just so exciting to drive around. I just love it. Of course, this was the first production car that used petrol injection. It's a three litre engine and it's a six cylinders and uh, goes like the wind. When you accelerate away, 
the power comes in and you, can, you have to wear your earplugs because of the noise and you're pushed back against the seat. We don't have any seat belts because they didn't have seat belts in those days. It would spoil the car if we put them in. So, but you're so snug in there in the cockpit and you drive it and you feel at one with the car. It is absolutely magic to drive. Today, it's a retro classic. I drive it around and young people stop me and they think it's a new car. They think it's just been made. That is because it's got these classic, these classic lines that really have never been bettered. By the end of the 1950s, the company had completely recovered its poise. It was no question, the most important car maker in Europe. And the company policy was clear. There would be two ranges of passenger cars and maybe one sports coupe along the way. It's almost then as if the designers took a deep breath, looked around, smiled happily and said, now it is time to make a flagship. As you would expect from Mercedes-Benz, the flagship was a quite amazing machine. This was the new Type 600, the new generation grocer, if you like, which, when launched in 1963, was the biggest, the heaviest, the most complicated, and the most modern supercar in the world. This car is a 600. This is a 1966 one. The first ones were built in 64, and they went on to 81. After that, it's a special order only. It is really the apex of all car design, in my opinion. They were aimed at important people. When our Queen goes to Germany, they still wheel one out for her. In its day, it cost about 25% more than a Rolls Royce. I still think it's very cheap because the complexity of it, I don't know how anybody could have produced it so cheaply. Although everything is expensive for what you're getting, is very good value for money. The hydraulic system is vast. It controls door windows, door closing, sliding roof, boot lid. The boot lid opens in two seconds and closes in one. All movements for the seats, length, height, reclining angle, they've thought of everything. I think it is over-engineered, but one must never criticise anything that's over-engineered. You can only criticise when it's skimped. And really, these cars were made towards the end of the period when designers, proper automobile engineers, were designing the cars and not electronic wizards that think they know it all and accountants whose sole interest is in profit, before they got in on the act, these cars were built as the engineers would like them. The temperature of the car, whether it is heated or cooled, remains constant. It has an outside temperature feeler, and as the outside temperature changes, the inside still remains constant. This is really, truly remarkable for a car over 30 years old and it still works. I think it's the easiest Mercedes I've ever met of any period to drive. Um, to enter it, it's like entering a stately home. It's fast. The performance is akin to the sports cars in that period. It compared to the 230 SL Mercedes, uh, TR4, one of the Porsches. So really for a big heavy saloon to have this sort of performance is unbelievable. A 
an old friend of mine, he had one, and he used to call on me once or twice a year, and always he said the same, I feel like a king in here, and when I've got mine, I totally agree with him. It's the only way I can describe it. You feel like a king. I don't think there's any doubt that by the 1960s, the Mercedes-Benz motor car was screwed together better than any other machine in the world. Perhaps it's wrong to say it was already the best car in the world, but it was certainly the best built car in the world. In both their advertising and their sales literature, throughout the post-war period, Mercedes have provided cold technical information, illustrations to show the solid respectability of the car. People are never allowed to stray into Mercedes-Benz advertising. Shots of the car, the interior and the boot absolutely scientifically set up. You have no luggage around in pictures. You have no sense of any real human beings around. They're always shot abstractly in deserted areas, shot in studios. However, throughout the period, you get masses of technical information. Uh, uh, the earliest brochures to make reference to safety, for example. The earliest brochures to make reference to technical innovation in a way that treated people as if they had scientific knowledge. I don't imagine most people who read the brochures did have, but perhaps they were flattered by that. Mercedes-Benz is expanding in very many ways. We're into niche markets where we've never been before. We've got the A-Class model, which is a revolutionary car in the way that it's built and in the market that it'll address. Uh, that will appeal to a very, very broad range of people. We're also involved with, with the manufacturers of the Swatch company in making the smart car, which is basically a city car, a two-seater city car. Again, it takes us into a niche where we've not been before. And there are a lot of other products coming along in the future, things like the electric drive car. All of these cars will be coming along within the next two to five years. People buy a Mercedes-Benz car because they know, or they hope they know, it's going to be rock solid, it's going to be rock reliable, and it will live forever. 